If intelligent life existed elsewhere in the universe, how might we find it, and what would happen if we did? This episode, I got the chance to speak to Frank Marshies of the SETI Institute to find out more about searching for extraterrestrial civilizations. Hi, my name is Frank Marchis. I'm a researcher at the SETI Institute, and I'm also the chief scientific officer at Unistellar. I study exoplanets, I design instruments to search for exoplanets, study asteroids using eight 10 meter class telescopes around the world, but I also um, contribute to the citizen science of the Unistellar network. Fantastic. Thanks very much for um, joining me in the podcast today, Frank. It's really, really good to talk to you. Uh, I was wanting to, to um, start off by talking about the uh, SETI Institute and, and SETI itself, uh, the search for extra child. Search for extraterrestrial intelligence sort of sounds like um, it, it might it might sort of sound like uh, science fiction to a lot of um, people who've never come across the term before. Um, so I was wondering if you could sort of uh, enlighten us as to what what SETI is and how it's how it's done and and how the uh, SETI Institute is is involved in that. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Um, so SETI is a field of research. First of all, SETI is the search for. Uh, techno signature or intelligence in our universe. Uh, the SETI Institute is a non-profit organization in California and um, which was created uh, 35 or 36 years ago. And the SETI Institute is made of um, astronomers, biologists, uh, philosophers, any type of people who are interested in finding, searching for intelligent life in our universe. There is three main ways to do that at the moment. One is to search for techno signatures using, for instance, um, radio antennas or, or looking for lasers, pulse in the universe coming to us um, from technological civilization. The second way is to um, um, design instruments capable of searching for microbes into the solar system. And the third way is by studying exoplanets, planets in orbit around other stars. Yeah, it's uh, it's really it's a really fascinating field. I, I, I suppose um one of the uh, first first questions that comes to mind is if we're if we're sort of searching for um intelligent uh, extraterrestrial life elsewhere in the universe, are we searching for signs of technology from, from other civilizations, for example? Yeah, well, um, the city started, city research started by, by searching for radio signals. Those are signals coming from a civilization that could have invented, for instance, TV or radar. And we are close enough to them so we can hear those, those, those signals and understand quickly that they are artificial. Uh, this is one of the search, but now we have expanded this. I mean, this was done 35 years ago when we thought that the radar was basically the pinnacle of civilizations, but now we know that we have lasers, uh, we have new technology coming soon, which are even going to be better to communicate. So we're also searching for laser, laser signals. So those are, can you imagine a civilization knows that we are here for some reasons because they develop a new telescopes and they have been monitoring us and they found out that there is some light, uh, some variation of light on our, on our planet. So they say, oh, there may be someone here. Let's talk to them. So they design a large uh, lasers and they beam this laser towards us and send us messages. It will take 100 years for, if they are 100 light years away from us to receive it, but then they will tell us we are here. And that's the kind of signal we want to be able to detect. And that's what we call laser city or optical city. And then there is the exoplanet one. Uh, and this is very interesting to, uh, because it's a very new field. Uh, we discovered the first exoplanet in, 1990, in the 1990s, right? But now we know that there is probably 300 million habitable planets in our galaxy. So if there is life on, around one of these planets and a technological life, if we image one of these planets, we see this planet, and we, for instance, see the variation of light uh, on, on this planet due to seasonal effects or change in composition in the atmosphere due to a civilization, we will know that this civilization is here. It could be, for instance, the detection of, uh, of CFC. The, the famous gas we use in our fridges, or it could be the detection of an increase of a, of a gas which is not natural gas like carbon dioxide. 
I'm really interested in this um, notion of uh, detecting other other technologies. Um, is there a is there a sort of uh, an assumption that you have to make that um, an intelligent civilization elsewhere in the, in the universe or elsewhere in the galaxy would have had to create roughly this this similar technologies in order that they're creating a similar enough signal that we would actually know what it was and, and be able to detect it? That's that's totally correct. We we starting the assumption with a very anthropocentric point of view, meaning that we take human and we say, okay, where will be our civilization in 5, 10, 20, 100, 1,000 years? And let's extrapolate and search for the same type of civilization. Uh, it's true that uh, first it's very anthropocentric because we have a, a, our civilization is a technological biological civilization, and we have no proof that this kind of civilization are everywhere. Maybe biology that never leads to intelligence and technology. Maybe biology leads to intelligence only, but those will be species which are fully which are fully adapt adapted to their planets. Like imagine like our planet doesn't have human beings right now. Let's remove all of them we will have intelligence on our planet. Just look around, your dog is intelligent, whales, dolphins are intelligent. They have a different type of intelligence. They don't build things. They don't need to communicate to build lasers, TV, have pop stars and all of this, but they are intelligent. And they will be completely invisible to our research, our search. Sadly, we will, not be, we will not be able to see an extraterrestrial well, intelligent well. So that's one thing. The second part is that we also assume that this intelligence was created almost at the same time because the distance between in our galaxy, just our galaxy is so big, our galaxy is 100,000 light years in diameter, right? That if two, civiliz two civilizations need to, to appear almost together and to evolve almost together to be able to communicate to each other. And that's, um, that, that's difficult. It's, it's very unlikely. However, now we know there is 300 million at least inhabitable planets in our galaxy. The likeliness of this being a possible is higher than when we started the search 40 years ago. 40 years ago, we didn't even know there was planets in orbit around other stars. So that was really like, uh, that was really, we, we were doing an hypothesis which was really looks very crazy to most scientists. But now we know that there is planets and habitable planets, planets like Earth around other stars, then the likeliness of having a civilization like ours is significantly higher. Does that also enable you to adopt a more systematic approach? Because I was also wondering how, how the SETI Institute actually operates. What's, what's actually happening on a typical day? Are, are signals being sent out? Are you, are you monitoring star after star after star? How, how, does, that actually, how does that actually work? So I don't do the radio search, but I do know how, how they do it. Um, so we don't send signals, but first of all, we receive them, right? Um, they, we have, they have different programs, and one of them is to look at, to listen to every system which has a planet already. Uh, we know thanks to TESS and Kepler, the spacecraft from, launched by NASA, that there is planets in orbit around several stars nearby us. So what they do with the Allen Telescope Array is to basically listen to those stars. Because if there is a planet like Jupiter in orbit around one of those stars, it's like very likely there will be a planet, a terrestrial planet as well. So let's maximize the chance of finding a terrestrial planet like Earth by listening to the stars which already have a planet like Jupiter. So that's the type of search they do. They do this systematically. They also have different catalogs where they search for planets, uh, stars which are the same age as our sun. So this way we can assume that if the civilization evolved similarly to ours, then they may have the same type of technology. Or they can also, they also search for in the inner part of our, um, our galaxy. Because in this area, planets, stars, sorry, are older. 12 million billion years old, typically. So the civilization will be extremely advanced over there. So we may, we may, we may assume that they will be extremely noisy, technologically speaking. So if you look in this area, we may see a lot of technological civilization. And in fact, uh, uh, a paper published two years ago uh, using um, one of the radio antenna array in, in Australia 
show that they did not find after observing 100 million stars, they did not find for a week, sorry, they did not find any technological signals, unfortunately. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I mean, it is when you think about it, it is one of those sort of um, needle in a haystack searches, really, isn't it? I mean, do, yeah. do you sort of retain hope of, um, you know, some form of uh, success or uh, indication within, for example, your, your in my lifetime? Well, I, uh, I, I first I'm going to mention Jill Tarter. Jill Tarter used to say, uh, searching for life uh, using techno signatures like we are, we are doing, it's like going on a, with a boat in the middle of the Pacific, take a glass of water, pull the wa- take some water from the ocean, looking look at the ocean and say there is no fish, hence there is no life in this ocean. Because we just started the search. Even if the number I give you of 10 million stars is enormous, it's nothing compared to the number of stars we have in our galaxy, 400 billion stars. And it's nothing to the, to the, to the size of our universe, we have, which has probably around 3 trillion galaxies. So we really started just now the search. It takes a long time, unfortunately, at the moment, but we're speeding up. We're maximizing the chance of detecting these signals. We, um, you asked me what my expectation, what my prediction. My prediction is that we will find life in probably 10 to 15 years, but this will probably be te- uh, microbiological life. And this will be detected on exoplanets because with exoplanets, since we can sniff the atmosphere of those planets, even those we just transit around the stars, we can analyze very accurately the composition of those of the atmosphere, we will be able to detect the presence of imbalanced gases. It will be complicated. It will be a huge debate in the community. But I'm, I'm betting that in 10 years, we will have already a candidate, a planet, which is identical to Earth in, ta- in type of com- chemistry. And scientists will try to convince you that this is a planet which has life, like ours. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think... Um... The more you the more you learn about um even the bodies within our solar system and, and the more indeed planetary science learns about the bodies within our solar system and you think of those moons like Enceladus or Europa that have these you know subsurface oceans even even on icy moons it's it's conceivable that there that there could be microbial life so it, in the context of that, it does seem like an inevitability, doesn't it, that we will find microbial life on, on exoplanets? It, it it just must exist, wasn't it? It must exist, yes. <laughs> I'm convinced of that. And one of the reasons I'm convinced as well of this is because if you just look at our planet, Earth was formed 4.5 billion years ago, 500 million years after its formation, when Earth was totally not habitable as we defined it. I mean, I will put you on Earth Four billion years ago, you will die in a, in a, in a, in a half a second because the radiation, because the um, asteroid impact, the, the volcanic activity, the composition of the atmosphere, the density, that was not an habitable planet. And despite all of this, because we have liquid water, we had enough, um, in, uh, enough chemistry to kickstart life, microbiological life. So I'm probably a, a, an optimistic person here, but I'm betting that there is life in our solar system. I'm betting there is life almost everywhere in our galaxy on any planet which has liquid water. Yeah, I think I sort of tend to think that you're right. The, the more I the more I think about it, and the more I learn about it. Um, but coming back to um, specifically intelligent life or like uh, an extraterrestrial civilization, ha- have you? I'm I'm sure you have thought about this, but what what does it mean philosophically and and existentially to our species if if we do actually find um, evidence that another intelligent civilization exists? My my view on this is not really the classical view, so I'm gonna say <laughs> I'm gonna say <laughs> what I really think. One of the reasons we do the search is not only because we want to know whether or not we are alone. One of the reasons we do the search is because if we find an intelligent civilization, we will know that us, a biological technological civilization, we do have a future. We're not sure about that. 
think about it. As I mentioned before, our, and our, our planet could have, have an intelligence like wealth, not technological, and be happy with it. We are maybe an anomaly. We are not maybe something that evolution, the big, in the big scheme of evolution will lead to. Maybe intelligence, technological intelligence like we are doing right now is not something that is, is supposed to live for a long time on a planet. Maybe we will self-destruct. Maybe our planet will destruct, destroy us. Maybe there is no future for this kind of intellig intelligence uh, technology. So biological technology, sorry. So if we find someone like us, biological and technological, we will know that there is a future. At least there is two of us. And we have someone to talk to, someone to exchange information, maybe. Someone to kind of like a brother or a sister to help each other, to basically grow together. And that's an important thing. We are not, our, our civilization is not stable, per se. Look at around us, look at what's going on right now on our planet. It's clear that there is no we are not. We have not stabilized yet our planet. Our, our presence on this planet is changing it, and is changing it to the way that we can self-destruct. So, finding this intelligence elsewhere may be useful for us to learn from them, to exchange information, and to know we have a future as a species. The problem with that, though, is I uh, suppose that um, we wouldn't currently have the technology to certainly, certainly not to visit them within one human's lifetime. Um, and also, presumably, the sending and receiving of, you know, interstellar phone calls or or, or emails or whatever. Um, yeah. That, that you know that would take a, a long time as well, wouldn't it? Yeah, but you are thinking like a human being with a time <laughs> li a life a life of eighty years. I'm not. I'm thinking on the scale of a civilization, a thousand years. Um, Think about it. Uh, when the, if you had, had gone right now to uh, to talk to the Native American and told them, uh, to, if you had gone to see the Native American 400 years ago, 500 years ago, and tell them that we will have soon some tube of uh, of metal flying around and you will be able to go to see Europe in less than 14 hours, they will think you are crazy. The reason we invented uh, airplanes is because we suddenly started visiting our entire planet and we realized that we needed this this way to move faster around on this planet right when we will find another pale blue dot another civilization elsewhere if it's 20 light years away from us 100 light years away i don't know there will be a lot of motivation to go there to develop technology to go there right someone will will be born tomorrow and we'll basically growing up as a kid, knowing that there is on this uh, uh, around Alpha Centauri a planet which is habitable, and this kid will invent or will have the motivation to invent the technology that will send us there. And that's something that we always think that science works like a empty, uh, like self-sustained. No, science works but with the motivation of people around us. Okay, so the reason we invented airplanes because we needed them. The reason we will invent a faster than light propulsion systems or way to communicate using quantum entanglement will be because we know that we need it for something. That's so cool. I I really love that um, optimism. And you know you're, and and you know you're uh, probably right as well. I mean, uh, one of the one of the things I was going to um, hope to uh, pick your brains about was: um, is there also an assumption that if you find if if we find um, an intelligent civilization that we would even recognize it as life. Do you think that that the sort of the process of, of evolution on uh, another planet around another star would would solve the same problems and end up with something that actually resembled a human being or a, a sort of a, a humanoid form? You know that they wouldn't just be it's maybe like a, a homogenous blob that also happened to be intelligent. How do you how do you feel about um, the the uh, different shapes? for example, that uh, intelligent life might take? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a big question. That's a question that's keep busy a lot of biologists at the moment. Uh, people are trying to create in labs a different type of atmosphere and see what kind of imbalanced gas will be created by a different type of biosphere, which is not similar to ours. 
the carbon the carbon life life that we have. This is something that we just started to study. Um, the reason is because we are now on the verge of being able to image exoplanets. We are on the verge of getting spectrum of uh, atmosphere of exoplanet. And once again, science doesn't work in vacuum. Science works because suddenly we know that we're going to receive data coming from those exoplanets soon. So there is all this motivation from those biologists to create this, uh, these, model, these models. About advanced species, which are not microbes, frankly, I don't know. This is something you should ask to a biologist. There is so many uh, reasons for which we have this height and not uh, we're not shorter or smaller. This is related to the atmosphere of the planet, the density, the gravity, all of this, where we're coming from. We could have been advanced dinosaur, intelligent dinosaur. Unfortunately, um, uh, an asteroid destroyed them all. And so now the mammals took over. But think about it, a tiny change in the timeline of, uh, of our planet can completely change the, event, the, the evolution of a species. So we could have been very smart di dinosaurs or something completely different, something in the ocean. But at the end, because the, the asteroid destroyed uh, most of the species 65 mi million years ago, we are mam intelligent mammals. <laughs> Indeed. I don't have an answer, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving on to, to maybe a, a slightly more um, obscure train of thought, and it's um, something I was hoping to get your your thoughts on. As, as we're recording, we're we're approaching the seventy uh, fifth anniversary of the um, the Roswell incident, which I suppose is probably the most famous um, of the uh, so called U UFO or uh, UAP. Sightings, you know, or um, cases. Um, most people who think of UFOs will probably think of that that Roswell case. I was wanting to get your your thoughts on on that. Um, does does so called ufology play play any part in in SETI and the and the SETI institutes? How, how do you compare those two those two um, disciplines, for want of a better word? Yeah, um, well, that's a very difficult question, but the. The view on this is changing recently. You probably have heard like a year and a half ago, we had this meeting at the International uh, Astronautical Congress and um, a large group of scientists are pushing to create a working group which will be able to um, study UAPs. UAPs is, an, is the modern way of calling UFO because UFO has been used so many times by mov in movies and so on that we uh, we decided to call them this uh, um, atmospheric phenomena. So we don't really know and identify atmospheric phenomena. So what I'm, I want to say here is that there is more and more of those reports because people have the capability to record. I do, I, lo I do love the story of Roswell. It's the beginning probably of the UFO, uh, UFO stories. But think about it now. Everybody has his own computer. Everybody can record an image, a picture in literally a few seconds if they have a cell phone. So we have multiple recording of weird things happening in the sky. And we could be like scientists who refuse to see the truth, but we cannot hide our, our head in the sand pretending that nothing is happening. I mean, you do see them on the videos. People ask them every day. I cannot take an airplane say, saying I work at the SETI Institute without having someone asking me to, uh, to tell, tell them about these UAPs that were picture or videos that they saw recently. <laughs> so there is a movement now in the field of SETI to create a group of researchers that will basically analyze these, those videos, record those data, or record their own data, like the Galileo project, to understand what's going on at the moment in the sky. Maybe this happened a long time, has been happening over and over, but, and we, don't, we, we have not seen it because we don't have the capability to record it. Or maybe this is new. Maybe there is an increase of phenomena that we don't know about. I've, I'm, make, I'm making a hypothesis, of course. We don't know where they are. We cannot hide the fact that there is, there is something weird happening in the sky because people record it. So let's study them. Let's study them in, using the scientific method. The problem here is that scientists don't work only with fresh water and, and oxygen. We also need money to do this kind of research. 
And uh, there is no really real scientific institution capable of supporting this type of research. NASA will not do that, and other scientific organizations will not. So there is kind of a movement to kind of create this. Uh, the Galileo project is one of them, but there is others which are um, led by other scientists to try to get some funding, some seed fundings to be able to study those or to be part of the team which have been recording them and studying them like in the, in the military. So my view on this is that we don't know where they are. There is more of those, more recordings. The public pay, the, pay us with the taxes, so we cannot deny the existence of this and say this is a, a mass, a, a mass um, um, illusion. It's not. It's something, something happening here. It could be a military uh, weapon developed by other nations that we don't know about, it could be uh, some weird phenomena or weird the way the people have been taking the picture. I've seen some very interesting um, videos showing, for instance, how you can have someone moving fast in the background. I have the feeling that someone is moving super fast in the background by simply taking a video of a specific angle. I mean, there is all these illusions that can be also the, the result of those videos, right? So let's study them and explain that to the public. And if they are ETs, if they are extraterrestrial civilization, then we will say, hey, they are extraterrestrial civilization. Or we don't have an explanation. But we cannot hide it. We cannot now. It's impossible. So let's let's get some funding to do this research. There is also the, the element as well, just given everything everything that we've we've spoken about thus far, is that if um to to the if there are people who assume that those those sightings are intelligent life in spacecraft coming to visit Earth, um, it's a bit far fetched to to sort of think that, isn't it? You know, considering that they would have to come from a planet nearby, they'd have to come from a, some some other star system, and and therefore it, it would it would be beyond certainly our te 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 technological know how, wouldn't it? It, it, it sort of goes beyond what, what we know as scientifically yeah. and technologically possible. If they are truly in, this, in technological civilization coming to visit us, they're more advanced than us. Definitely. Because they are using propulsion system that we don't understand. They're capable of traveling on the long distance. And there seems to be more than one and different shapes and so on. But this is speculation on your side. I'm not. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm just saying it's interesting, truly. But it's very, it's very unlikely that they are aliens. Okay. But since it excites the people so much, let's just spend some millions of dollars to show where they are, yeah. instead of making, making, creating this media frenzy about about them. Let's just spend a few ten million dollars. Give that to a bunch of scientists, like a group, create a group, and they are going to analyze them, and they are going to try to find an explanation. And there is, there is no explanation. They will publish a paper saying we don't have an explanation. That's that will be interesting. That's a scientific method, and that's the way science should be working. I think. <laughs> um, I was also um, wanting to uh, speak to you about your uh, involvement with um, Unistellar because a lot of our uh, a lot of our uh, listeners and readers of the magazine are amateur astronomers and practical astronomers. Um, so I was wanted to talk a bit about that because the uh, the technology behind Unistellar is pretty cool. I was wondering how you how you um, got involved with the project and if you could tell us a little bit about um, what makes Unistellar um, or well, yeah, w what attracted you to it, um, in yeah. the first place. Yeah, so I joined the company in two thousand seventeen as a co founder. In, my, in fact, I met the, the three first co-founders at the Consumer Electronics Show, and uh, they talk about the telescope, they have a prototype, and I brought the SETI Institute, I brought the crowdfunding, crowdfunding science, the citizen science, we call that now, and the idea that we could use all those telescopes to observe the sky continuously. That's my goal, in fact. My, real, my true goal is that if something happened in the sky right now, I can just send a notification and there will be someone on this planet with a, with a unistellar telescope that will take a, a picture or a video of what's happening. And maybe you link it to what I'm just say, I, I just mentioned before, right? <laughs> it could be anything. It could be um, 
an asteroid passing by uh, Earth, which has been discovered, for which we want to refine the orbit. We do that already. It could be a transiting exoplanet discovered by TESS that we want to confirm. We do this as well with using the unistellar network. It could be an, a, star, an, an, a star being occulted by an asteroid, which is the mission. The, uh, which is a target of a mission of NASA. We have done that for the Lucy mission. So this is our core science we develop at the moment. We are soon going to be able to do uh, comets. We just started a beta, beta project to observe comets, observe them. And we are trying to get the first picture of uh, 2021 03 pen stars, which is just, just coming out of the sun at the moment. And we hope that our network will be the first one to detect it, to see if the, plant, if the comet has survived the perihelion, for instance. Uh, but we can do more. We can do supernovae. Uh, we can do as well laser. Guys, laser. Um, laser SETI is a project by SETI, from the SETI Institute, which is going to observe the sky 24-7 to detect those lasers. If one day we detect one of these lasers, the unistellar network will be, will be put into contribution to observe those lasers to continuously. So we will never miss the message, the, the content of this uh, of this message, for instance. We can do that with our, our unistellar network as well. So, and the idea behind it as well is to help people to understand science by doing science. And one of the problems we have in our society is that people really don't have a clear idea of what scientific method is. So instead of tell, telling them in classes and boring, bore them to death like they have been doing in, for the past uh, 200 years, we make them do it. We make them do science. So some people have never done, never had a telescope before. They observe with the telescope. They send us the data. We process them. We send them the result, and then they get more and more interesting. And now we have a, uh, some of our citizen astronomers are joining groups of, uh, of professional astronomers to be. They have truly became astronomer using our our telescope. Now they know how how to find when there is a test transit. They know how to extract uh, uh, information, photometric information using the data. So we are making them do science, democratizing science and bringing science in every house who has an interest by buying this telescope. Fantastic. Yeah, I was also interested in the, um, I was reading a bit about uh, Unistellar and I was, I was finding out about, um, there, it, it's sort of, the system can sort of um, update and adapt to to things like light pollution in real time, can't it? And I was interested in that because it was because I know that you part of your work as a as a planetary scientist, you're you're interested in the development of adaptive uh, adaptive optics. Um, do you think that that's the way forward? That that sort of gr ground based telescopes um, can uh, react to things obscure in the night sky, and and does that eventually then negate the need to launch um, space telescopes? Um, I would say we always need to launch space telescopes because the atmosphere will always absorb part of the light, which is very interesting for astronomers, far infrared, UV, for instance. There's a lot of information coming from this uh, wavelet range. However, we are building now very large telescopes on the ground, like the ELT, uh, the TMT soon. And those with adaptive optic system, we have a better resolution than the uh, space telescopes. Uh, we have, for instance, published the uh, past two years pictures of asteroids, large asteroids using the sphere instruments on the VLT in visible light. And you can see the crater, you can see the central peak of the crater on asteroids using ground-based telescope with adaptive optics invisible. So it's clear that this is the next, this is the next technology for ground-based telescopes. And I don't want to minimize the impact of space telescope. I'm betting that the first uh, spectroscopic observa observation of uh, potentially habitable planets will be coming from the from one of these extremely large telescopes, the ELT or the TMT, because they have the aperture sufficient to capture the light invisible to detect the to get enough photons to do an analysis of this of the atmosphere of those planets. Fantastic. It's very very exciting stuff um well i think that's probably we're sort of running out of time that's sort of all we've got time for um frank but i want to say thanks very much for 
speaking to me today and um, sharing your your knowledge about SETI. It's absolutely fascinating, and, and hopefully um, a lot of people will be getting excited about it um, again as we approach, you know, the, the Roswell 75th anniversary. Um, but yeah, thanks thanks for coming on the podcast and speaking to me today, Frank. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I come back whenever we want and to talk about the next next generation of telescopes, Unistellar awesome. or ground based telescopes, whatever you want. Thank you again. <laughs> Look forward to it. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you.